incredible chapter in the whole of Scripture. In the last few weeks, or actually all of this term, we've been uh, opening this prophecy, this vision, this book entitled Revelation. And the Greek word for revelation is apocalypsis, which actually means unveiling. And it's, it's almost like there's a door. It's almost like there's this portal that on, on one side of the coin, um, you've got the seven churches in Asia and they are living in reality. They're living in the Roman Empire. They're living under persecution, doubt, uncertainty. They are living in this world. And, and their bishop... Bishop John from Smyrna is the last of the 12 apostles. The, the theory, the thought was that Jesus would return before the disciples died out, but 11 of them are dead of the original 12, and the only one remaining has now been carted off to Patmos for the, to, the, to the copper mines and is in exile. Where is the hope where, where is the light? Where is the light at this end of the tunnel? And then in that moment, John has a vision. And it's an apocalypsis, and it is an unveiling. And it is like a door is placed beside him on this island. And the Lord says, look, I've placed before you an open door. I want you just to go through it. And as you go through it, you will see... My world, the Lord says, you will see my world through my eyes, through my perspective, and it will give you perspective on your world. And do you know the amazing thing about the book of Revelation is that not only does John in his vision receive an invitation to go through the open door, actually, because it's written down for us, we get the opportunity to go through the door as well. How cool is that? And our circumstances are very different. We're not living under uh, Domitian. We're not living <coughs> under the rule of the emperor. But we, we too have our circumstances. We too have our sufferings. We too have our doubts. We too have our challenges. We too have our questions. So let us go through the door with John. Let us go through the door along with the seven churches. Let us try today to see God's world through the eyes of Jesus. So Revelation chapter 4. After this, I looked <clears throat> and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the, voice that I, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me, like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Chameleon. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing, these are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, 
even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. We give thanks to God for his amazing word. Do you know, um, one of the books that I've been uh, relying on to try to gain some understanding of, uh, of this vision and this revelation is a book by uh, Tom Wright, uh, the professor, uh, which is entitled Revelation. And in this book, Tom tells this time, tells the story of when he was walking into a cathedral as part of a great procession. As, as, as they were walking into the cathedral, his companion, a senior clergyman, was looking at the service paper that they had been given. And this senior clergyman looked at the service paper and he said, ah, I see that we have Revelation chapter 4 as the second reading. And this senior uh, clergyman smiled and went on to say, it's one of the most wonderful chapters in the Bible. Knowing that he was setting himself up, Tom Wright asked the obvious question, what's the other one then? And his smile grew even broader. Revelation chapter 5, of course, he said triumphantly. So we arrive, having journeyed with the seven churches, we arrive at chapter 4. And actually we arrive at the throne room of heaven. Verse 2, at once... I was in the spirit. There in heaven stood a throne and someone was sitting on it. Do you know, I think, uh, I think the way I would describe Revelation chapter 4 is a bit like the Chronicles of Narnia. I've, I've, as an introduction, I've just said it's like there is this open door um, as I looked, verse 1, as I, after this I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. And, um, and in some ways we kind of think that, or, or it would be easy to think that this door is a million miles away, that it's that this door into heaven is high up in the sky like a tiny speck, like a star um, in the horizon. But I actually think the reality of heaven and earth is much closer than that. I actually think that heaven is, is so much closer. And I think actually what we see here is this door is placed right beside John on this island. And I just see it a bit, C.S. Lewis Amazing visionary, amazing insight into things. It's like going through this wardrobe into another world. One moment you are here in reality and the next moment John is given this invitation to go through the door and he goes through this door in the vision and ends up in a completely different world. Whereas before he could only see his world. He could only see his vista. He could only see his horizon. He could only recognize his own isolation, the suffering, the persecution, the vulnerability. Now, just by going through this door, going through the wardrobe, so to speak, he's led into a completely different world and he gains a completely different perspective. The invitation... The invitation is to come up and see what is going on. And I think that's an invitation here to all of us today. I, I actually think that there's an invitation 
to us to, to go through the door. Come and see, come and see the things that must take place. Come and see your world through my eyes. I, I think one of the most beautiful things we can do in prayer is, is just ask the Lord, what's your perspective on what's going on, Lord? What's your perspective on what's going on in your world? What's your perspective on what's going on in your church? What's your perspective on what's going on in, in my family? What, what's your perspective on what's going on in my workplace? What's your perspective on what's going on in my relationships? What's your perspective? And I believe that that open door is right beside us. And I think that because he's a father, isn't he? God is our father. And, 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 and the writer in Hebrews said that, says that clothed in Jesus, we actually have access right into the holy place. That, that we've got the pass in Christ to access all areas. We can go right into the throne room of heaven and we can sit with our father and we can gain his perspective. And so there's this invitation to go through the door. And I want to ask this morning, just very simply, because this is really the hinge. Revelation chapter 4 is positioned as the hinge in the book. The first three chapters are really giving us the reality of this world, the reality of the church, what they're going through. Now, as we go through Revelation chapter 4, we enter the throne room. Everything from this point forwards is, is God's perspective on our circumstances. God's perspective on his world and where it's leading to. And so this is quite a pivotal moment. And the question that we're looking at this morning, therefore, just as an introduction, is what does John see? behind the door what does John see behind the door actually there's so much detail here there's a scroll that we're going to have to talk about there are seven seals that we talk about if we're talking about the 24 elders here we might gain the perspective that that is symbolic of perhaps the 12 tribes of Israel and uh, the 12 disciples and so we might see that as a picture of of the, of the people of God. The 24 elders fall down, lay their crowns down at the foot of the one who is seated on the throne. There is a lot to see here, and we're going to go through it together in the new year. But just at this moment in time, in this opening sequence, there are two things that I just want us to focus on. Two things that I think are central to the throne room. You see, the first thing that John sees as he walks through the door is a throne. That sounds quite obvious, really, but it's important. Verse 2, at once I was in the spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And I think there's a really interesting parallel here. You see, if you look through scripture, in the most difficult of circumstances, we see through the sweep of scripture in the Old Testament, what we see is that God will often give his people a vision of the throne. The common denominator here is the people of God are going through a difficult time. What does God do? He gives them a vision of the throne. Look at Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, along with all the insecurity and uncertainty that came with the death of the monarch on earth. In the year that King Uzziah died, what did the prophet Isaiah see? Isaiah saw the Lord, and where was he? Seated on a throne. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the, king that Uzziah, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. When the people of God had been carried off into exile, in their forlorn circumstances by the rivers of Babylon. I, it's a bit before my time, but I'm, I'm thinking Boney M here. Do you know what I mean? By, is that right? Have I got that right? Yeah. By the rivers of Babylon. Can you sing it for us, Steve? 
<laughs> By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and we wept. In that lament, in that separation, in that shame, in those circumstances by the rivers of Babylon, what does Ezekiel get? Ezekiel, the prophet, is given a vision of an eternal throne. When Daniel also was in exile, when God gave him a, a really difficult prophetic word about the abomination of desolation, in the context of his vision in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel is given a vision of what? He's given a vision of a throne. In the face of King Ahab, what does the prophet Micaiah see? In 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 19, this little known prophet Micaiah, in the face of King Ahab and Jezebel behind him, has this vision. This is what he says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing round him on his right and on his left. And, and so we think of Isaiah, we think of Ezekiel, we think of Daniel, and we think of Micaiah, and now we get John. When the seven churches of Revelation were going through the most challenging perse persecution, what does their bishop John see? There before me was a throne. And what we take from this is that so often in scripture, when the people of God are facing the most challenging and difficult of circumstances, God responds by giving his people a vision of his throne. Why does he do that? What difference does the throne make? What difference does a picture, what difference does a picture of the throne make when you are going through a difficult situation. I think it's simply this. I've been, I've been thinking about it this week. I think the vision of the throne is the ultimate seat of authority. It's the seat of authority. It's the crown. It's the crown. It's the seat of authority. And I think what Jesus does, I think what the Lord Almighty does in difficult circumstances, I think he shows the seat of authority because I think he wants to know. I think he wants you, I think he wants his people to know that ultimately he is the authority. That ultimately he is in control. No matter what happens on earth, no matter what the people of God are going through, no matter what powers of darkness seem to be closing in on you, no matter what overwhelming trial is upon you, God, God is seated on his throne. God is the one who is in control. The universe belongs to him. The living creatures belong to him, which is the symbol of all creation. The 24 elders, which is the church, belong to him and the sea of glass which probably is symbolic of all the chaos in the world it is all seated at his feet all creation everything within it belongs to him god is in control god is seated on the throne and i just pray that for each one of us today we would have that vision of the seat of authority. God is in control of your circumstances. You might feel that you're being tossed around in a sea of chaos at the moment. But God is seated on his throne. You might feel that you are going through the most overwhelming trial. God is seated on the throne. You might be feeling like you're in a tunnel and you can't see any light at the end of it. God is seated on the throne. God is in ultimate control. So in difficult circumstances, as John goes through the door, the first thing he sees is a throne, but then there's a second thing. We have to trip into chapter 
5 um, for this. Not only does John see a throne, but he then sees a lamb standing in the center of the throne. Look at chapter 5, verse 6. After he sees the throne, he's, so he's just gone through this door in this vision. And the first thing that really strikes him is the throne. But then as he looks closely, he sees that someone is on the throne. And as the vision unfolds, as more is unveiled, he sees a lamb. Look at verse 6. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. You know, the truth is this. It's not just the vision of the throne. It's not just the seat of authority that strengthens and sustains the people of God. It's actually the one who is seated on the throne. Christ, the lamb who was slain, <coughs> is seated on the throne. And, and I think the fact that it's a lamb looking as if it has been slain gives us great encouragement. You see, the, Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Christ learnt obedience from what he suffered. Isaiah spoke of a man of sorrows. What Jesus suffered, he endured. Je the lamb endured the pain of being misunderstood by his disciples. The lamb, standing in the centre of the throne, suffered the agony of the garden. The lamb, standing in the centre of the throne, experienced the cruel nails of the cross. The lamb, standing at the centre of the throne, experienced the pain, the shame, the rejection. In his sacrifice, in his perfect, eternal sacrifice, the lamb of God experienced all of this. In other words, the one who sits on the throne knows how we feel. He's not aloof. He's one who's standing there looking as if he's been slain. He knows what it is to suffer. All the feelings that God experienced on earth through the suffering of his son have been carried back onto the throne. All of his earthly experiences, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, all of that experience on earth now resides on the seat of authority. It's incredible. Not only are they there, not only are his sufferings there in all fullness, his sufferings are there for all eternity. Do you know what that means? It means he knows how we feel and it means that he really cares. That's what it means. What does the lamb look like? It looks as if he has been slain. It is the Lamb of God who is seated on the throne. Ultimately, it is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. What I'm saying is this, the one who was laid in a manger is now the one who's seated on a throne. Isn't that incredible? We, we have seen his glory. Do you know the throne, this is what, this is just the introduction to the vision. The throne tells us that God is in control. The Lamb tells us that God really cares. Isn't that a great message? Isn't that a great vision? If you're going through the ringer, if you go through the door of heaven and you see the throne that tells you that God is in control and you see the Lamb seated on the throne telling you that God really cares, that's a message of encouragement. And that's the message of encouragement that I want you to receive today. Let's just go to the, the, the final slide, Ali. 
I'll save that story for another day that I was going to share. There we have it. I've tried to invite us today to go through the door, to go through the door along with John. And, and as we go through that door, we see what John saw. And I just wanted to bring it together. When you look at the manger, you see Jesus who cares. When you look at the throne, you see Jesus is in control. And my encouragement is simply this. May, may in, in whatever circumstances we face, may God grant us a fresh vision of the throne and of the Lamb. Amen. Let's pray together.